Welcome to the fourth annual Guild of Music Supervisors Conference. So let's start a little bit about like kind of the journeys of when you were first aware of, and Ben, we'll start with you. Tell me a little bit about when you were first aware of how music and, and picture began to work together. Did you work as a musician with that relationship in mind, or did you kind of come into it later? Um, well, I mean, you know, I, I watched Star Wars when I was a kid. I mean, I, as far, I, mean, I guess it depends on how far you want to go back. But um, I think where I really became aware of the potential of those kinds of relationships was, was Kubrick, obviously. Yeah, um, yeah. the the uncomfortable. Um, uh, well, probably The Shining more than anything, but also just the, the the way that music and what what that relationship is, I think, is is showing that the dialogue between those two uh, objects is doesn't have to be. Um, it doesn't have to be conversational in the sense that they're recognizing one another. Right. Like the conversation is actually in the audience. Like the effect that that the combination of those things ha have on one another outside of um, the actual image itself. Which is to say that <laughs> most of my favorite film score is not film score. Right. Um, it's music that is running in parallel to a film and that you're having to absorb that relationship uh, at the same time. Mm -hmm. And that's where the interesting thing is for me. So, yeah, I mean, with that in mind, it's, it's something I think about a lot like in, um, in, in writing for picture, which is to say I don't really write for picture. I write off ideas and then put them to picture, mm -hmm. um, I guess. I don't know. And Paul, do you remember a little bit of how your relationship I mean, you had a classical background, right? You were originally working in classical music. I had a, I, I studied classical music, and uh, that had absolutely no bearing and no relevance on um, film scoring. Um, that happened later, sort of accidentally on the side with Tangerine Dream. You know, there was there were some films that they were doing. It was pretty monochromatic because. You know, as Tangerine Dream, you get kind of asked for one score, so you do that one score in variations. And it just seemed like easy work at the time, I'll be honest. You know, it was just something we did on the side, score a few films, move on. Um, then after I moved here, um, it sort of, you know, and, and became part of this scene. It opened a little bit up for me where I said, hey, there's different things you can do here. And it's actually, this was right about the time in the 90s when the, music industry started to sag a little bit. And um, and so I just developed an interest and, and a taste for it and found that compared to the uh, music industry career uh, options, it seemed to be offering more versatility. You know, you could do all kinds of different film scores as the same composer, whereas if you get known as an artist, um, you can't stray from the formula too much. Once you get successful, you're going to have a little bit of a sort of an expectation put on you. And, and yeah, you can go against this expectation, but but generally you don't are as free as, um, as in film scoring. And, you know, the uh, I think The Shining was a, uh, a great example. There were a handful of films that basically broke through conventions of, of film scoring and I think really changed um, a lot of people's thinking about um 2001, I think, was also one. Uh, Shining was one. Alien, uh, for me, was one. Um, and, you know, and you watch these films um, and you go, that, you know, that's so much more interesting than, than a traditional approach. And, and you feed off of that and uh, you go into things. Now, to what you said about, um, you know, juxtaposing a lot of great films, uh, the music was written before the film was shot. You know, uh, Once Upon a Time uh, in America famously was shot to that music. It's mm -hmm. a case where, so it's film music, but it was written before the film and then the film was shot to the... Uh, then you have Amadeus, now that music was written 200 years 
before the fact and works pretty damn well. So, <laughs> uh, but that it frames to, it. You can tell that they use that as a template from the very beginning. Yeah, that is to say, it generally is helpful if the music creation, or in my experience, is helpful if the music creation is independent of film creation. So you write some music, you have some picture, and then you match it up and you you kind of gel it to to what the context is. But there's also situations where a director comes in and says, hey, I want this exactly here and this exactly here and this and there. And, uh, and you still have to satisfy that request. You know, so it's not, yes, in an ideal world, I'll pre-write everything. I write a glorious piece of music. I match it up with the film and voila, uh, here's a, a, a genius exposition. But there's also sort of a functional day job part of, of writing film where, you know, 30% or 40% are not going to be glorious. It's just going to be okay. It's pretty tricky what they're trying to do here. I kind of get it. Then you have the discussion with the filmmakers and you try to understand what their story approach is. And then you try a few different things. It becomes sort of a, a mechanical process almost at that point, You know, where you're applying the skills that you've accumulated and say, can I find some way through this? You know, And that's when revisions come and, and this is all... It's all part of the same, um, same process and same situation that you put yourself in when you say, yeah, I'm going to write music for this TV show or picture. Tell me a little bit about your process of how you're carving out that space. Well, I, I picked the clip for two reasons. One is because it starts with the line, you want to hear a story, um, which seemed appropriate for the panel's uh, subject. But, uh, but two, because this particular scene went through a process of trying quite a few things like opening and endings are usually the things where you you know Struggle. you you put in option after option and trying to to calibrate it right and what we found here is a less is more you know you need to let the sound effects speak you need to build it really slow so you know any coming in with a melody or you're coming in with too much of a statement kind of takes away from the story takes away from the space takes away from the characters so it's a slow gradual build that then has to, to A, go into the exterior space and to the shift around on the control at the end. Um, so I'm planting with the music both that obviously there's something sinister going on, but there's also a sweetness in, in this connection, you know, and so it's a little bit telling, laying the foundation for the movie in one scene without overdoing it, which is pretty much every opening to every film. Or, or Do you strip show. it back to get to that point? Uh, all the time. All the time. So it's like, like you had more than you hear? Well, first of all, there's multiple versions of this cue. And then this of this particular version, this is the most stripped back version of that version. Mm. So it's it's all, I, th I think that's the much more important process to taking out mm. for anything, by the way, it would apply the same thing for music, you know write a piece and then take out whatever you can because it's going to be better. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. We, we find also with Source a lot of times that in a weird way, like if I were to be critical of the original approaches, especially for openings, a lot of times there's too much invested in the first ideas. You're trying to do too many things with that piece of music. And you're trying now to throw very different angles at it, all of which are strong approaches or very confident approaches. And frequently, it is sort of the process of an undoing the scene is recognizing where the truth of it is. And usually it is actually much more stripping back, I think, for source as well. Mm. Unless you're looking to make an impression. And then the question is, how hard do you want to calibrate that? Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of curious, when you think about the openings that you've worked on, have you found the same process, that it's usually been a stripping away process, or has it been more of a layering? One? Yeah, well, I mean, I think that that's kind of like, like stripping away is sort of implicit in my sort of working method for the most part. Um, but that aside, I think also, you know, we've been in that situation, well, at least I've been in that situation several times where it's very clear um, that the 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 music is being used as a crutch for like you know a lack of proper sound design ADR that sounds like shit you know um, performances which aren't what they could be right effects that aren't finished you know so like the 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 music kind of becomes this sort of band aid for those problems and like if it stays like that for too long 
Um, temp yeah. Well, not even so much the temp. I'm talking more, more about like that, that idea of like the, the way the, everything is being pushed is, is inadvertently being pushed around like based on its relationship to the music, mm -hmm. which is, um, problematic in that, uh, you know, when I want to do much less mm -hmm. as is often the case, um, it, it feels like too naked. Whereas like, like for me, that's like, you know, that's why I was kind of curious because I, I can't imagine that you, you can't start there. And convince anyone. It's like you need to sort of like, you do you know what I mean? There. You have, to get, you have to get there by like this process of just, just muting things and hoping no one notices. Like right. you know, and eventually getting it to that point where it sort of can sit there and and just be. Yeah. You know, um, and, and sometimes it's also a test of you're testing the directors, producers, whoever the key creatives in there. Uh, you're testing to see where your elbow room is. Right. You know, and, and sometimes you know. I tend to kind of go in to elicit a reaction on the first wave in hopes that either I don't shake their confidence in me, which can then become a huge problem in the project later on. Oh God, we hired the wrong guy. Or I try to figure out, is there some component of the story that they may never have thought of that is really important here? And I'm finding a way to really capture it. Like one example is that Leon this morning, uh, uh, Leon Vitali had spoken a little bit about The Shining and about that opening. Mm -hmm. And he said that originally Kubrick had been working with a piece by Sibelius, which is the, uh, the Waltz, uh, I forgot, uh, the, uh, it's the Sad Waltz. Mm -hmm. And that that had been running in the theater, they'd been playing with the kids, it was in the hotel set everywhere, they were playing it all the time, they thought that would be the opening. And it wasn't. What they ended up using was the Walter Carlos, Wendy Carlos, you know, opening, which is extraordinary and very dark and very foreboding and really telling the story of where we're headed to, not the story of this family going off on their disappearance adventure. So I'm curious if you guys sometimes find that when you are thinking in those terms, that when you're scoring act four in act one or setting it up almost like a prelude in, in an orchestral setting, do you find that sometimes backfires on you and now you have to kind of scramble back to get their confidence back? Or do you feel like the right filmmakers get that? And they might say, I get what you're doing. It's not quite what we need here, but it's an interesting idea. How does that, how does that conversation start? Um, well, I think like my approach is, is, is generally been to allow somebody else to make the decision about like, like, where the music actually belongs like like i'm more interested in just writing it um and i'm not really I, I really try to avoid as much as humanly possible work in the picture because i just don't think it's it's not helpful to me um you know uh the what's really interesting is to work off the idea you know and so i've i've you know with, with something like dark i mean just um I mean, essentially, the the director, you know, and the the we were running like four edit suites simultaneously for that show, um, and basically everybody received what is, for all intents and purposes, a um, an album of music that I wrote, you know, for that purpose. Um, there's it, it's it, it's basically just like a huge folder of variations on themes, you know, and and in terms of like what actually became. You know, like for example, like the the opening of the show, which we can take a look at. I mean, that that's the sound of the show, but like that was one of like twenty things that could have been. The, it hadn't been the no, idea that no. you thought was going to be the one. No, I mean, it was. It was. It's definitely like thematic, and it's you know, it's it's definitely central to what I was writing. It's one of the first things I wrote, but it it um it wasn't. Uh, I never thought. It, okay, this is the thing for the opening scene because I'd never even seen the opening scene really right. when I started writing. It was just an idea of many. Let's, well, let's talk a little bit about sort of how that layering process goes because there's a lot of sounds that are in here mm -hmm. and it sounds like there's a lot going on in each of them. Do you find that, are, how are you building those elements? Would you say that the editors got that in its form or that they kind no. of came back to you. Yeah, tell me about that process. Basically, they got all that stuff. Um, a massive bin. A massive bin of, of pieces, which were, you know, they didn't have the the, um, the orchestral recordings. It was all, like, just MIDI, MIDI bullshit and, yeah, lots of bad-sounding strings and whatever. Um, and then, basically, they started editing, like, those as a, as a temp score. Um, but I've then 
like in parallel went off and started recording all that stuff uh, so that you know it was it was, wasn't like I was swapping out temp but it was definitely like that was it was clear how that um how that could work you know based on that idea and I was essentially just then honing in on a better version of what they had kind of used right and laid out. I mean if I if I fundamentally disagreed with it I'd try some try something else but I mean in in that particular case that's that's like a a weird sort of crossfade of I think two of those things, um, which sort of more or less makes the the arc of that of that opening. It sounds like part of your process is capturing the mood of the piece as a whole, yes, and the tone of it as a whole, mm -hmm. and then being able to let them figure out what they want to do with that. Right. Have you been in situations where? you've emotionally felt like you've taken in the story and you've really processed it and you feel a real sense of what the key component, the thrust of the story is. And then they came back and said, no, you've got it all wrong. Well, I, I think that that, that, that that right there is the thing that I'm sort of trying to, I want that to happen as early as possible. Right. Um, so like when I sent all that over, um, you know, if, if they'd sort of come back and said, well, this is shit, right. like, um, then I'd know that either I'm going to have, like, I'm going to have to really, like, reinvent the wheel here or they'd be better off, like, working with, with someone else. Um, you know, honestly, like, that that was my, my thought at that that point, that point because, like, yeah, I, I, I mean, that's why I'm really fascinated by the way Paul's able to sort of, like, um, shape shift through these situations because I... I, I I don't know how to do that. Um, Let's talk honestly. about shape shifting. I mean, that's. Uh, I, I <laughs> well, full disclosure: Thomas and me have been shape shifting through four seasons of uh, Hot and Pitch Fire together. So a lot, a lot of shape shifting <laughs> going on. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and I also worked on a on a game with Ben. So we we all know each other for a while, and uh, I you know I don't think that there's a particular method to it. I think what happens is um, after doing a number of shows, um, you sort of you learn the, the political dimension or landscape of a project a little bit. At least that's what happened to me. I was very naive when I first moved here. You know, I mean, like I said, Danger and Pain was basically the same situation uh, in installments. And then coming here and uh, being thrust into different situations, uh, I remember, um, you know, <laughs> Also, you know, English is not my native language, so that didn't help. I was in a meeting and somebody mentioned subtext, you know, and I had no idea. And so, of course, I blurted out, so what's subtext? You know, I mean, I was laughing. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it took a few embarrassments uh, to catch on and eventually build enough skill and, and language that, you know, by the time we met, um, um, on Pitch Fire was pretty good because, you know, these writers and creators for these shows are incredibly well-spoken. Um, you know, they had... They had a, written a really good show. They made really good points, and you kind of want to be on the same level with them and be able to have a, a conversation about uh, you know how we're gonna tell this story the best way. And there was a lot of trading I felt that was going on. It was one this show in particular. You know, it was a good back and forth between creators, music supervisor, and composer. It had to be because it was a music driven okay. show, and it mm -hmm. was a period specific show. And um, that's the ideal, you know, you don't get, we were both, you know, sort of saddened when that show ended because you don't get many shows like that, but you're aiming for that, you know, and to some degree you have to make do with whatever the project presents, you know, and if you go into, and this is the other effect that happens after a few years of doing this and you go into one where you go like, oh, I can just tell this is a bad composition of, of characters here we're dealing with, you still have to deal with it mm -hmm. one way or another. And I still have to sort of eagerness to somehow make something out of that situation but it is much more difficult and it's much more of a sort of a relief and an inspirational boost when you get into a pro you start a project and you go like this is an interesting this is like putting a band together you know mm -hmm. so if if you put a band together and you know the bass player sucks it's just not yeah it's not gonna be a good gig you know yeah. do you miss the tangerine dream kind of jammed picture thing? um I still jam to this. <laughs> no, I mean um, that is still going. It's funny because I'm working on a on a music project right now with Peter Bauman, uh, you know, one of the original uh, members of Tangerine Dream, and um, 
you know, it's tangerine green esque in a certain way, and, and we talk a lot about we we're trying to recapture some of that seventies magic, you know, the early tangerine green uh, magic. So I talked with him a lot about um, that time, and and it's pretty amazing. Uh, what sticks out to me is how limited um, they were in their means. You know, how little they could do with the technology was big and crude, and you couldn't do a whole lot with it. Uh, the concerts were one key, you know, had to be one key, because once you got it tuned, you had to leave it in this. Yeah. It was one tempo, because the delays were Revox machines, so, so you once you set those. the tempo, you're kind of stuck with this tempo. Yeah. And if you think about that today, you know, say to somebody, okay, you're going to play one key and one tempo uh, for, you know, one and a half hours or so. Good right. luck. That's a Paris Hilton uh, DJ set. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so it's it's the point though is limitations can be a great great help. And you know if they don't come with the territory, sometimes you have to create them yourself. And for me, it's always sort of the, the do not list is always more important than the do list. And so approach in in film school and for me is sort of the same. I start with excluding sort of the okay, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. So. I found one thing which I, I found really fascinating in working with you, and, and Ben, you and I have not had a chance to work together before, but uh, I'm, I'm confident we will. One of the things that I really loved about working with Paul, and I had this experience also with Dave Porter on Breaking Bad, is you and Dave both have, um, you have an aversion to doing things that don't need to be there. You always figure out how can we do this with as little as possible as directly and cleanly as possible and not make the score into an albatross that's in the room. And I think that the gracefulness of that is, is extraordinarily helpful. And for me, at least on music driven projects, which Breaking Bad to a certain degree was and Halt was in a different way, it made the counter relationship really good because it felt always that you would always be this, the voice of reason. And I kind of felt like it gave me a chance to throw ideas that were a little bit more outside of the box, outside of the palette, outside of the taste range of the people in the room, because we knew always that we could come back to a place that would always get to the grounding of the story. And I kind of feel like that, that sort of nuanced approach to storytelling is sometimes very rare because a lot of times between composers and music supervisors, it becomes an ego nonsense. And I find too that if I have a very ego-driven composer, I tend to pull back because I don't need to have a difficult relationship. Mm -hmm. I want to let that person have that opportunity to do what they need to do and then let the showrunner be the one to say, okay, let's find a way to kind of bring this back to where our story actually is, not the idea that we'd like to project ourselves upon the story. And I think that's a really interesting and odd balancing act. And I'm curious if you've had this experience with supervisors as well, where because your work is very, very strong and very mm -hmm. confident, and it plays a very strong role in it. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious if you've been in situations where the balance is, like, how is it with you and Lynn on, on Dark? Because that's an interesting shift. Also um, a period piece. Yeah, well, I mean, it's... It, I, I've, I've often said, I've, on, it's, it's weird to say, but I honestly believe that in most situations, I'm the worst person to decide on how my music should relate to an image mm. like i'm more enamored when it's somebody's kind of taken something i've done put it in a context that surprises me and then i find a way to equalize mm. that right you know like to kind of take that surprise and, and find a way to get it right better. exactly yeah um because the, the, you know my my sort of approach to music is about like a piece of music is finished when i don't want to touch it anymore right and so, you know, when somebody takes a piece of something I've written um, and puts it in a new relationship with an image, there'll be a hundred things wrong with that. Like, that just an annoy me, you know, for technical reasons, for, you know, how maybe the tempo, the key, like whatever it is, the way it relates to sound design especially is a big one. Um, and I'll sort of like, you know, um, I'm not precious about, kind of the the internals of it just the sort of overall shape of it is the thing that really disturbs me so like it's just about like tweaking and maybe it's it's really simple maybe it's fundamental um but usually that fight like is the most interesting mm. part i think mm -hmm. because it, it, you're not kind of i kind of want to build this sort of 
frame and then and then just start removing like Jenga, you know, like mm-hmm. how how, how, how much before can, it tumbles. Yeah, before it falls off, it falls over, you know. Um, it's actually not that dissimilar to how music supervisors with, work with music editors because, you know, when when I always know exactly how I want it to be when I'm presenting it, and I stop myself but not saying an email saying lose verse two there's a weird cool turn that's in the middle of the bridge so if you cut it off half and then you echo out here it's going to be a beautiful way out and i know that i want to do that but if i do that i'm going to a take away the creativity of the music editor and two they may do that intuitively on their own which validates whatever idea i've had but more frequently they do something completely different right and i'm like wow, I was so worried about dialogue over lyrics and I'm not now and I'm excited by it. And now I have new life with this because someone else has added to it. In the same way that if one of the members of my team throws an idea to me that I never would have thought of, and this happens all the time now, and I'm just like, oh my God, this is exciting because it's fresh. It feels like a new relationship for me now. I mean, I I have a music editor I work with. Um, I try to bring in on on everything, um, and we've we've got a really good dialogue now. And he's he's absolutely crucial to <laughs> to, to me being able to work as a film composer <laughs> because it's like yeah, I mean that that's kind of what he does. He he'll, he'll take that thing mm-hmm. and 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 play with it. And often, like you said, he's, it's really surprising. Um, and often, yeah, my my favorite thing is just to let him kind of do his thing and then react to it and go, okay, that's. That's not what I thought was going to happen there, right. but it's just as good, if not better, than what I would have done, done myself. You know? Do you think that he sees things in your work that you're not Absolutely. able to? Absolutely, hundred percent. Because that, to me, is sort of what I also really love. Is I love that I have such an emotional relationship with Annie Q, and I get very emotionally attached to characters and very emotionally attached to. It's a very vulnerable experience to put music against picture when you care about a project. And I love the liberation that comes from somebody seeing something in there that I hadn't seen, hadn't thought I was totally blind to, right. but does something really magical in it. So in a weird way, there's something nice about that separation. It's what I love about the collaboration component. And I'm curious for you, Paul, because in a way, being a composer can be a very lonely job in a sense. You can be kind of you know off on your own planet, but when you're bringing other players in, you start to have other ideas come in, and if you're having several, if you've got several showrunners, which also happens at times, or a director and producer who are both quietly trying to get you to move in their direction, how do you find yourself usually um, surprising yourself in that process? Um, I'm not sure it, uh, what the way is it sort of about the, the team kind of composition or team approach or managing kind of that you're working with different... I think it's a collaboration process and I realize I can't answer what that question is really <laughs> either. Um, uh, but I think that what I'm curious about is, is from his vantage point, you know, when Ben is thinking about how his music editor sees things in him that he doesn't see. In the same way that if you think about a lover, when you fall in love with a lover, you fall in love with them seeing things in you that you can't always see yourself but you know it may be there. And so I think in a weird way, any collaboration has a component of that. So I'm curious for you as you're collaborating with the group, because you are talking about politics, you're talking about mm-hmm. uh, time constraints uh, and different musicians coming in. Do you find yourself playing a certain type of role in that, or do you find, like, where, where are the interesting parts of that? Well, you know, the, the showrunners, or in the case of a film director, are sort of the big circus director, and I'm the small circus director. You know, I have a small circus to run, and they have a big circus to run, and so we meet, and, and then we compare notes. But... You know, of course, over time, you build up a core team of people and uh, that involves music editors, musicians. Um, I would expand in, even into picture editors and music supervisors. You know, I mean, you, you just gravitate to people where, A, you don't have to explain it uh, constantly. You already have an understanding. And B, if you've worked on something before, then you already have sort of a starting basis. You know, it's it, it just really uh, is... Uh, less necessary than to establish you know so i find overall in hollywood this is what happens people just gravitate to each other and that forms groups it forms projects and one thing will will lead to another and this is sort of how this process i mean a a friend of mine um he uses always the same cellist and it's his brother and he says it's and and we talked about this process and I said uh, and he said I just don't have to explain shit to him you know right and this is sort of uh, this is kind of what's um, what's in this uh, part because music now is so 
you are so enabled to pretty much do anything you want that this limiting this, yeah, I know I can do everything I want, but I'm going for this particular thing, you know, and the more I have to explain this and, and uh, spell it out, the more it takes away from this process. Whereas with people that you already know, and you know, they're sort of on that page, can just send stuff back and forth and go into a process straight away. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, if we did uh, another project with the Chris's, it would be the same thing. We wouldn't be starting a new show. We'd be starting on, we already have that much rapport. So it's a lot of things we don't need to talk about. We can focus on the things that are sort of, that are new or we want to do different or we're trying to do a different angle on. So I think that's a, a natural process. And I don't think it's ever been any different, honestly. Creative people have sort of clustered through history and uh, you know whether they were sort of shunned and then two shunned people find each other and support each other <laughs> or or some other form of uh, interest alliance mm-hmm. i think that just that just continues to happen you know and and as things change as surroundings change uh, these these alliances shift a little bit too but uh, you know we find somebody who's fun working with you and try to work with them again. Yeah. And you get to build stories together and find ways of kind of evolving. And it's fun to find yourself playing left-handed sometimes when you have a new, same team, new project. And that's always sort of a blessing where you're like, okay, we don't have to figure out egos or relationships or trust. We're kind of going in saying, okay, we all know that we're really good at this. Let's see how we can find a way to do it in a different way. Well, listen, I, I think we unfortunately have to wrap this thing up. But um, thank you, everybody. Paul Hasslinger, Ben Frost.